checks out, right? Um, pull that up a little. Okay. Sorry, so welcome to all of you to the Institute for Policy Studies. We have been turning ideas into action for peace, justice, and the environment for 50 years. And behind our, our three uh, guests and speakers today is a little bit of our history. This is a mural done by a wonderful DC person, Andy Shalal, an Iraqi American, of the history of social protest and of people who have joined with those social protests. But today we're really pleased uh, on the eve of the semi-annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF to have a panel on Egypt and what's going on in Egypt uh, that um, at a time when Egypt has become, unfortunately, is becoming an increasing uh, target of, in particular, the International Monetary Fund. And we have the great uh, pleasure and honor of having two great experts on Egypt and on what's going on in the Middle East overall. Uh, and a, we're really pleased to welcome back to IPS uh, a former IPSer who worked on the World Bank and IMF when she was here, uh, Bumika Mukala, who is uh, now with, uh, who's been working with two great allies of ours in Geneva, the Third World Network uh, and the South Center. So Bumika will introduce the session and, and our speakers. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John, and thank you, IPS. This is um, a, a really wonderful space to be in, um, in lieu of the IMF World Bank meetings. And IPS has always provided a space for progressive community and dialogue and exchange in Washington. We're really happy to be here. So thank you, John, and IPS. So I'm here um, with two um, wonderful um, activists and colleagues from the region. And before I introduce them, I just want to, at the outset, introduce, just say a few words about the context in which we're here. The Arab revolutions have been going on for a couple of years, but their history predates in terms of the forces that were driving these changes during uh, many of the dictatorships in the countries. And what we're trying to maybe bring into the conversation, especially in the so-called belly of the beast here in Washington, D.C., is not just the interface with the international financial institutions, but what does it mean for the Arab revolutions to be talking about the changes they're going through vis-a-vis -vis all the other different movements going on around the world as well. So we really want to bring in the uh, larger global context of the uh, movements for social and economic justice. Um, he, here we're going to be addressing some of these issues such as what does it mean to foster national leadership that prioritizes public interests based on a developmental vision and strategy in the Arab countries? What does it mean within today's global economic governance context where there is an ever-growing uh, persistent threat of reducing the meaning of democracy to elected representatives who are often compelled to pursue the same social and economic policies irrespective of their ideological affiliations or change in political parties? This context carries multiple changes to reclaiming citizenship and democracy in the Arab countries and complicates the possibilities for a clash on spaces for people to draw up new and transformative economic and social realities. Um, I want to introduce to my right Mahinur El Badrawi, who is a researcher at the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights in Cairo. The, Eco the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights is a human rights organization that works on research, litigation, and advocacy, and promotes social and economic rights. Mahinur is the program officer of the International Financial Institutions Monitoring and Foreign Debt Programs at the Center's Research Unit. She is also responsible for the Center's partnership with the popular campaign to drop Egypt's debt, which is a grassroots movement in Egypt that is um, on the ground doing campaign advocacy, research, and building solidarity networks with campaigns globally. Before that, Mahinur worked as a researcher for the Hisham Mubarak Law Center, specializing in the rights of persons with, with disabilities. 
Uh, to my left is Kinda Mohammadia, who is a policy advisor at the Arab NGO Network for Development. ANND, which is based in Beirut, Lebanon. She works on social and economic rights, development policies, trade and investment policies, and in particular, the uh, surge of bilateral investment treaties and investment agreements in the Arab region. Um, so I'm going to leave it to my um, two guests here to begin some conversations, and then we'll open up to discussions. And are we going to have discussions coming in through live stream? Or Thank you, Vumika. Uh, is, is it on? No. OK. Uh, so Vumika introduced me, so I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> to say anything else about myself or what I do. But uh, I just wanted to give um, a brief of what economic and social um, reasons for uh, the, the revolution, the Egyptian revolution that uh, started when the not not uh, not ju not just happened, but s just started in uh, January 2011, uh, and then uh, speak of um, some current challenges to the economic and social movement uh, in Egypt, and uh, talk about what we've been doing on the ground, what what campaigns there there were. I'll speak about uh, just s three of them, and then um, we'll see what we'll. Uh, what we'll uh, want to do afterwards. So, um, as far as the, the the Egyptian revolution, yes, it's it's true that what started on the on the eve of the 25th of January were mainly uh, demands for uh, civil and political rights. They were. Uh, the, the, there was a movement, uh, the 25th of January is the uh, anniversary of the security forces or security uh, police. For uh, So at, this, at the same day, the uh, people went out in protest against um, the torture of, uh, of a citizen called Khaled Said. This is seen as the flame of the, uh, of the, the, of the uh, revolution. Um, however, what has happened throughout the 20, the 26th, the 27th, and the 28th, the, 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 the three first eves of the revolution, is um, uh, um, a massive uh, mobilization of, um, of social movements onto um, ta taking ad advantage of this momentum on, uh, onto, onto the, the revolution. So we can see that um, by the time the uh, by, by the time the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, which uh, which is the uh, committee that uh, held Egypt um, executives. Uh, the, the role of the executive of the, the head executive of uh, of Egypt for two years until we had the uh, the presidential elections, when they uh, they stepped up in um, in January 11th to to claim that the, the the president will step down and then they will take charge, uh, came in response of uh, very wide calls for uh, civil disobedience and uh, and uh, state uh, statewide strikes. So we can see that at this point there were the uh, the railway workers were on strike, the uh, the uh, other public transportation workers on 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 strike, and there was a, an open call for 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 civil disobedience, and it hap it was happening uh, gradually. And at this at this point, where there was uh, there was no more. Um, leverage really for the regime to 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 continue on being stubborn and and, and there was there was a need for for a move and and, and this is this is this is when in in my very personal opinion economic and social uh, movement played a role into uh, into bringing about an, an an alternative reality to to what's happening in egypt um so we can see that even prior to uh, to uh, the the revolution, there was in in 2010 um, there was the minimum wage campaign that was that was uh, that that took that took place with with a, a verdict for a minimum wage 
in which the, the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights was involved, in, and, but as well as other uh, trade uh, unions and, uh, and uh, trade union federations that also took part of the calling for uh, a general strike on the first days of, of the revolution, which is the, the IFI2, the Independent Federation of, uh, of uh, Trade Unions. Um, and there was there was a uh, after after this this uh, campaign there, there there was finally a, ver a verdict that there should be a minimum wage in Egypt and the group that came out of such a campaign became known as the Independent Trade Union uh, Federation. Um, what's happening What's happening now is that uh, unfortunately uh, after. Um, after after the uh, the elections, what the governments in, in in place now have been trying to sell um, sell its its political uh, position according to certain ideological backgrounds, uh, but without paying attention to what the people uh, to what the people wanted, what were the what what were the the, the labor uh, groups and the the social movement asking for. Uh, during the, the revolution. For example, and this is something that uh, if somebody was following will know that one of the main demands of the of the revolution was Aish uh, Hurraya, Karama and Thanaya or uh, or um, bread, uh, liberty and, uh, and dignity and or social justice. And uh, so what happens is, is that you get the, the, uh, the brotherhood, the, um, now the, the current government is, uh, is uh, affiliated with the, with the Muslim Brotherhood's um, party or comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood party. Um, and their answer to the, they, they, they clearly foster the, the continuation of uh, the previous uh, economic and social uh, plan of um, of of the Mubarak regime, and which 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 feeds into the global uh, mainstream or orthodox uh, economic framework, international economic framework, really. So um, so you see them. You, so you see the 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 the, the brotherhood going or the Brotherhood's government going on to uh, talks with the IMF loan that that uh, that, um, that fosters uh, austerity austerity measures on the on the poor um, and does not does not really impose any uh, reforms on on businessmen or investors uh, you see the same going uh, you see the same going on in, in other structural um, in other st structural um, issues of uh, of reform, for example, the constitution just had a constitution voted on in December uh, 2012, and uh, and and what it did is is that it um, um, at least uh, at least on 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 labor uh, on labor issues it it, it kills the um, the the official space for um, a multi. Um, Multi trade, uh, multi trade union federation. So it just caused that there should be one unified uh, trade union. So you see them, that albeit the fact that the, the independent, uh, the independent trade union federation had a great role during the, f the, the 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 revolution and was recognized. in as far as the reforms in uh, the uh, the official uh, trade union federation, the state trade union federation, it was uh, right after the revolution uh, recognized as corrupt and problematic um, for for many reasons. There was a committee there was uh, within from the independent trade union federation, which which uh, its inception happened uh, after the, the revolution or during the first days of the revolution was there was a committee from the independent trade union federation that is to do un or undergo the reform in uh, in the state federation uh, nevertheless uh, its role was was uh, undermined or or it was uh, the the state is trying to to uh, to to kill the movement really by uh, by by the the constitution saying that there should be one official uh, trade union um so uh what we what we uh, what we're doing now in in egypt uh, as as a, a counter 
space for uh, for that as a counter space for the uh, for the the same uh, new liberal uh, trends when it comes to to uh, to economy uh, and uh, and, and, and the very conservative or, or repressive uh, policies of the state on and in, in so far as rights and liberties. Uh, we had a campaign, for example, called the workers and the farmers write their constitution. It started in uh, or its launching event was in December 2011. Um, and uh, what it did is that it uh, it's in, in partnership with uh, 200 uh, independent trade unions, along with the the the, the independent federation of uh, of trade unions, in which the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights was the secretary. So we don't we 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 see the role of of uh, of uh, of. Uh, civil society organizations or we see the role of NGOs and human rights center as supportive but not um, but, but not uh, they do not substitute the role of social movements and trade unions so what we did is that we really toured 20 26 governorates uh, we got uh, the feedback of uh, trade unions uh, trade unionists and uh, of the of uh, uh, of workers, of, of, of regular just uh, w workers and farmers and fishermen uh, as to what do they want in the new constitutions? What do they see um, as the rights or the wishes or their dreams and desires in, uh, in, in a new constitution post the revolution? And what we found, uh, what we found out is that we, 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 were really, we were really surprised is that the people know their rights more than uh, than we do people wh what people came out with usually think that oh we need to educate the people we need to talk to the fishermen we need to co talk to the workers tell them all oh, the international covenant on economic and social culture rights says so and so and so the ILO says so and so and so but they were telling us this uh, it was it was uh, so we collected the narrative we have very detailed narrative of what every every person said and we uh, and after that we uh, we filtered them into specific rights or or or, uh, or areas, uh, and then we brought on um, what we call specialists or or uh, or um, experts to draft them into a constitutional bill. Uh, so we had this bill; uh, it's out. We presented it to uh, the uh, the state uh, committee uh, th that that wrote the the uh, constitution. Um, Unfortunately, not a lot of it was taken into consideration, but uh, the the fruit is in the process itself. So this is one of the campaign, and we're still in uh, in uh, in uh, in contact with with all those uh, those encounters that we had in the different governorates, and we're we're seeing how we could pressure for uh, once we have once we have. Um, a parliament, because Egypt doesn't have a parliament uh, momentarily, how could we uh, pressure for um, inserting amendments uh, onto the current constitution throughout the, this uh, broad uh, grassroots base that came, uh, that came out of this campaign? Um, there is also a working uh, committee, a, a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, committee on workers' rights. Um, that under that uh, that goes into negotiations with the state on the law of uh, freedom of uh, of association uh, what could we do since the the, the constitution does not give uh, freedom of association uh, so what what could what could the, what could be done and we're uh, we just had ILO uh, ILO specialists on, from the interna from the international staff during on coming on to the discussions with the minister uh, of uh, of labor force. Um, another another campaign that we have that I think is very interesting is called the uh, popular campaign to drop Egypt's debt. Um, the main the main um, idea behind the campaign is to uh, assess the odious debts that Egypt has uh, taken during the Mubarak era. Now that we have, uh, we have we've had a revolution, now that a dictator has been toppled, we are saying that uh, the loans from uh, the IMF and World Bank and other IFIs 
or uh, or states really that have not been used to um, for the development of, of the people uh, or for the purposes uh, for which they were uh, alleged should not be paid for anymore. Egypt uh, currently pays 25% uh, of, uh, of its public spending on, uh, on, on debt. Um, about 15 or 10 to 15 percent of which goes on to uh, foreign debt. So we're, what we we're, we're calling for is uh, really um, an audit of, uh, of, of those debts um, before we go on to taking other loans or other debts like the IMF loan that is now being uh, negotiated uh, under the Deauville uh, agenda and, and that would be used as a seal of approval for, 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 uh, for an influx of loans that is about 20, uh, 20 billion dollars for the financial year uh, 2013-2014. Um, we went and talked to the, uh, to the parliament uh, however, now that we that we don't have uh, a parliament, also we're, we're, it's still it's 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 hard to uh, it's hard to talk to uh, to have constituency to talk about to to in uh, for for that cause. Uh, but what we but we we're, we're still trying to advocate for this through uh, our opposition to the current loan to the to the IMF loan for and we, what we've we've had. Uh, Mobilization with different uh, so uh, civil uh, with different grassroots movement as to uh, highlight the uh, the 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 the, uh, the effects on the, the the harmful effect on the on uh, on the people of the of the of the of the loan now and how it could be a repetition of the odious. Uh, lending that we've been having for the, the past decade, decades, given that the, that the framework the, has been the same, that, the, that the, the, the legislative framework for investments and, uh, and policy framework has been the same and has not uh, changed. Uh, I think we have had a lot of success with this so far. We had a, a great uh, uh, march and uh, when, when uh, just, just uh, two weeks ago, when the IMF um, staff has been living, has been visiting uh, Egypt, we've had a lot of press uh, coverage. Uh, finally, the uh, the idea of the IMF loan and the austerity that it gives, and how much it will affect the poor versus uh, bring actual reform uh, in. Uh, on the investment uh, patterns have been put on the agenda of the the, the press. We see it coming uh, coming out uh, in uh, in TV, in talk shows, in the things that the, that uh, could popular popular popularize the cause more and more. So um, I think that's uh, that has been uh, a, lo a long uh, a, lo a long struggle, but. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's successful, and we and we're uh, we're moving forward. Especially that now the the average citizen sees or, or s is starting to talk about what such what what appears that uh, at certain point as such uh, a high intellect discussion uh, actually mean on their uh, on their uh, on their everyday life, and that they have as much say. Uh, about it, as the the ministers and the uh, and the high level uh, staff and so forth. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to take uh, more time than this and just give Thanks, the. Very clear. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So I, uh, my name is Kinda. I, I am in, engaged with the um, a platform from the Arab region called the Arab NGO Network for Development, which works across uh, 11 Arab countries on economic and social rights and policies in the Arab region. So within this framework, we have been trying to understand and look at the revolutions and uprisings of people across the Arab region. But honestly, after two years of the revolutions, and which are ongoing still, it is sometimes very painful to reflect on where we stand today. Because two years ago, what we saw, what gave us so much hope, is an accumulation of 
and the result of all the pains and the struggles of people that have been accumulating for years and years. And then we saw that there's a light and there's a reclamation of the space and the ability to be part of redesigning a different kind of future. But honestly, we didn't expect the backlash and the attack against this claim uh, on rights that the citizens of this region try to do. Uh, this is why one of the things I want to focus on today is what we are trying to push back against in terms of the reading and the diagnosis that we are uh, getting from uh, sometimes nationally, but mostly as well from international institutions about what happened in the region. Because if you look at the central line that uh, is uh, repeated across the different diagnoses reflected in reports from international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, they try to say the problem was in the governance. We agree that is part of the story because our struggle was also to redesign the political governance in the region. But that is not all the story. So what they are trying to say is there was a corrupt system. <laughs> they are trying to say that there was a corrupt system and uh, uh, governance was decayed. So uh, if we solve this problem in terms of corruption, we can repeat the same policy choices in terms of economic and social policy choices that the previous regimes uh, uh, undertook under their supervision. And then we can achieve the results that we have claimed would be uh, 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 resulting from this kind of model implemented in the region. What we are saying is that not at all, the problem was a problem of governance, but it was a problem also of conscious selected policies that were designed for the benefit of a certain uh, uh, interest group in the region and not for the public interest, not for a broader collective developmental future for the peoples in the region. And this is one of the core messages that we are trying to put forward, because I think this is one of the central points that underpins the, dif uh, that underpins the different priorities that we have uh, uh, compared to the kind of priorities that are designed by international financial institutions and the interest groups that are still very much alive uh, uh, at the national level. So this is basically the start of the, uh, 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 the, the start of our struggle. If we look a little bit back in the, uh, in the history uh, of the economic and social uh, challenges and processes in the Arab region, we see very significant trends that are core to our uh, understanding of what needs to come in the future. Over the last two to three decades, across different Arab countries, despite the differences of the realities, we see a very significant trend. We saw a regress in productive capacities across the different Arab countries, mainly seen in big economies like Egypt, like Morocco, like Tunisia. We saw a regress in the uh, ability of productive uh, processes to contribute to employment generation. And we saw definitely a regress uh, and a decay in the manufacturing capacities of these countries. At the same time, we saw a rapid concentration in the uh, uh, services sector, which is uh, uh, considered a priority sector in the uh, global economic uh, uh, thinking today. But the problem in our countries is that the concentration was in the low end services sector that was uh, definitely not creating the decent kind of employment that we were looking for in the region. At the same time, another trend that is core to what we saw is the regress in wages as a, as a, as a percentage of the national incomes. And I think this is a central reflection 
of the violation of economic and social rights of people and the marginalization of the citizen in terms of their economic integration in the, uh, in the uh, cycles, economic cycles at the national level, and their ability to contribute to the economic cycles at the national level. So overall, economies in the region were uh, designed around the mainstream economic orthodoxy that we have seen control the world. So we saw expedited processes of trade and investment liberalization, of privatization, and of borrowing and accumulation of debts. At the same time, we saw the regress in the productive sectors that I was uh, 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 alluding to. So our uh, struggle as we see it today is to reverse these trends because we see that the revolutions were a reflection of the uh, uh, opposition to these realities and to these trends, and they were uh, a, a reclaim on the right to redesign all these economic and uh, social realities. What did we see after the uh, revolutions? Very few months after. So you can uh, go back to the, f uh, the beginning of 2011. You saw the uh, uh, proliferation of reports from the IMF, from the World Bank, and from other international uh, institutions like the European Investment Bank and, and others, focusing on the need to stabilize the economies in these countries and uh, to uh, understand that the problem was a problem of corruption and that they are ready to work with the governments in the Arab region to design longer term developmental plans that will be inclusive and will be working for the poor. So this was a line that was very well used to remarket a new image for institutions that were insisting to repackage old recipes under new uh, 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 titles and to push them uh, forward uh, as the uh, only options that are available for the new leadership that was uh, being created in, uh, in the region. And unfortunately, what we saw is that the new leadership in Egypt and in Tunisia was ready to re-adopt this, or maybe they actually have interests in uh, stabilizing the same model. So this is something that we are trying to look closer at and to try to understand in order to uh, uh, try to see our way forward as well and how we can uh, uh, insist on our right for, uh, uh, for playing a core role in terms of redesigning eco our economic realities in the, uh, in, the, in the period to come. One of the things that we are uh, focusing on is that the, the state in our countries was something that was a black spot, was something that citizens were uh, uh, always cautious of, uh, of because the state was uh, linked to the police state, the state that hamper, uh, that clashes down on, uh, on citizens' rights. But what we are saying is that this is not a black or white. The state is also, could be also, the developmental state, the state that could design the collective uh, uh, coexistence and the collective realities that are uh, based on equality, that are based on redistribution of national resources for the interests of everyone, and that is based as well on a vision of a state that plays an active role not only nationally and regionally, but also globally in terms of uh, 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 recreating and uh, 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 re-establishing spaces for alternative policies as well at the global level. And we really see in Egypt and we really see in Morocco and Tunisia uh, the potential for countries that could re-establish uh, their role at the global level in terms of, uh, along with other uh, developing countries, in terms of redesigning uh, the, uh, the, the way global policy making in terms of economic policy making, financial policy making, and uh, global uh, developmental uh, policies are, uh, are designed.
So this is another thing that we are trying to focus on and to say that the role of the state should be uh, central to our uh, rethinking of uh, developmental uh, uh, future in the uh, region. And that does not necessarily clashes with our ability to think of uh, the role of the private sector as well in the region. But also we need to unpack our uh, uh, thinking of the role of the private sector because we need to find a place for the national private uh, uh, capacities to be nurtured and to uh, have a space to grow at the national level and consequently at the regional level, and to play a role vis-a-vis -vis foreign private uh, uh, entities and private investments that have a role to play in our uh, 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 countries and definitely are central also to uh, uh, redesigning economic uh, uh, futures of our countries. So this is another point that we are trying to, uh, to focus on. And the third point that we have witnessed is the proliferation of the IMF loans in the region after the revolutions. So now you have an, a, a loan agreement with Yemen, a loan agreement with Morocco, with Jordan, and negotiations were ongoing with Tunisia and Egypt. So this is a significant widespread uh, uh, re-emergence of the IMF in the Arab region. And we see that the IMF is trying to use the Arab region as a platform to redesign and remarket its uh, its role uh, in terms of uh, being an institution uh, that is active across uh, developing countries uh, again. We are very threatened by this expansion of uh, of the IMF loans in the region because we see in it a significant backlash on the policy space available to uh, current transition governments and also future governments that uh, will be elected, uh, hopefully, uh, in terms of uh, 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 in terms of their uh, space to use different kind of economic policy, whether it is fiscal, monetary, trade, investment, and other policies in a dynamic way that is suited to the developmental uh, uh, status that we are at in the, uh, uh, and the developmental challenges that we face, specifically in terms of the challenge of rebuilding productive capacities, rebuilding the uh, ability to generate decent uh, uh, jobs in the region, and rebuilding the ability to redress inequalities uh, at the national level and also across uh, the region. What we have witnessed in the IMF intervention is that they are very good at marketing themselves as now looking beyond numbers and like understanding how their interventions would impact different kind of constituencies at the national level. This have been a line that you can see across different press statements and reports coming from the IMF. But if we are looking more closely, and we are monitoring the kind of reports, uh, country reports that have been elaborated and put forward by the IMF before the international crisis in the region, and then after, till the rev before the revolutions, and then afterwards, we don't see much of a difference. And actually, we see a very consistent line of uh, uh, policy recommendations that uh, uh, definitely were core to the economic and social uh, uh, res for defining the economic and social inequalities that were at the roots of the uh, uh, revolutions. This is why one of our main uh, roles and what we are trying to do here the, 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 this week is to uh, try to unpack the uh, the uh, policy recommendations that were advanced by the IMF across different uh, uh, periods of its intervention in the region, and to try also to question what implications it could have on the uh, on the future of developmental policy making in the Arab region. Uh, to end, I would like to highlight two things. One is uh, the importance of the re-emergence of the role of labor uh, movements across 
the Arab uh, uh, countries. Definitely in Egypt, as Mahinur uh, uh, described, the independent labor movement is uh, a, a movement that we should all work with and that we are uh, uh, actively engaging with. The Tunisian labor unions were core to uh, making the revolution because the uh, Tunisian labor unions have been strong even under have been strong even under the Ben Ali regime, and they were central to uh, uh, pulling together the uh, revolutionary energy across the uh, different. Uh, areas and regions of Tunisia. So we think as civil society organizations, our <coughs> struggle and our ability to stand up against this backlash that I was uh, trying to, uh, uh, to describe cannot take place except if we build the bridges and the collective work with the labor unions. And the second thing we also believe is that the, the struggle that we have at the national level is very much a reflective a, a, a reflection of the struggle that we collectively have at the global level in terms of uh, insisting on our right to redesign the global economic governance and the institutions behind global economic governance uh, in an alternative manner that not necessarily uh, stabilizes uh, uh, or sets uh, short-term stabilization uh, objectives that are uh, targeted on in inflation uh, uh, objectives like the IMF likes to uh, focus on, or uh, other short-term uh, uh, private-led uh, interests, but more broadly to redesign uh, global economic governance for the public interest and also for allowing national uh, leaderships to design their national economic and social policies in a way that fits with their national challenges and which necessarily is different across countries and should be different across countries and should not uh, be built on a one-size-fits-all uh, model. So this kind of collective struggle, I think, allows us to think together as active uh, citizens' movements in the region and more globally or uh, uh, DC-based, if we are uh, uh, talking today, on the collective uh, uh, channels and bridges that we can build together and that we can uh, uh, benefit from in terms of standing up to the kind of uh, backlash that we see not only in our region, but I think uh, globally. Thank you. Two really inspiring presentations right now, and I would implore all of you to feel free to ask questions and to start um, discussions that you're curious about as well. But also, just um, quickly in closing, I wanted to also mention that um, uh, it's 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 important to tap into the synergy between the very social movements around the globe right now, the aspirations and the hopes and dreams and struggles of most social movements have this common thread, whether it's Occupy, whether it's Arab revolutions, the Indignados movement in Spain, indigenous movements in South America, similar movements across Southeast Asia as well that are also facing austerity measures and trade liberalization. And one of the, one of the, one of the, 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 the most universal themes emerging is um, the slogan that was um, celebrated a couple weeks ago at the World Social Forum in Tunisia, where my colleagues were also there. And the slogan in Tunisia at the World Social Forum was dignity. Just one word, dignity. And it was so profound and so visceral. It really comes down to dignity. It's, it's, it's more than just new economic and social models and structural transformations that we talk about 
and it's 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 more than just um, economic security or just political issues. It really comes down to human dignity about redefining what is it to be a human being. What is it to be respected? What is it to have the ability to feed yourself, to feed your family, to 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 obtain an education, and after that education, to obtain a job, and what kind of job? What is decent work? Um, sort of this deeper existentialism that marks so many of the social movements that gives it this spiritual force that allows it to have a, a collective uprising, that allows it to have collective momentum. I mean, the reason why hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands show up on the street is because something is resonating deeply. Something is resonating in the spirit. So these aren't just technical issues we're dealing with, but this is really a, in, um, the most fundamental expression of the human spirit. So I just want to leave it with that. Yes. Um, first, just specifically about Egypt, uh, it's mostly in the Islam, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood government, uh, 